Now we're going to move on and think about the most important class of hydrophobic host molecule. And the reason they're important is that you can make them on massive scale. So they're industrially relevant for supramolecular chemistry. Lots of the things that I've shown you are beautiful, elegant pieces of supramolecular chemistry, but the molecules are complex and big and hard to make. And you make a small amount to prove it binds really nicely, but who can use that in an industrial setting? These molecules are made by the enzymatic degradation of starch. You can make them on the ton scale. And the name cyclodextrin means it's a macrocycle composed of sugar units. And the sugar that it's composed of here is glucose. And in this particular example, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven glucoses in a ring. We can, by this enzymatic degradation, make rings of different numbers of glucoses. We could have six in a ring, seven in a ring, or eight in a ring. And we will call those alpha, beta, or gamma. The alpha, beta, gamma doesn't refer to the stereochemistry of the sugars. They're just, it's just an arbitrary nomenclature used for the size of the ring. They might as well have called them six cyclodextrin, seven cyclodextrin, eight cyclodextrin. Why they didn't, I don't know. Okay. Decisions lost in the mysteries of time. Now, the way these molecules look is rather like a bucket shape, a ring of sugars. Of course, they have different dimensions depending on whether they're alpha, beta or gamma. We can think of them as the small one, the medium one or the large one, rather like the three bears. And we're going to see how that can be used later on. The structure of this bucket shaped has an apolar interior. All the CH groups on the sugar are quite apolar. So they have apolar interiors, but they have OH groups on the rims. And these OH groups mean that they're really nicely soluble in water. And you might have noticed from the structure of the glucose that we have some primary OH groups and some secondary OH groups. And each sugar has one primary and two secondary. And what happens is you get the primary alcohols on one rim and the secondary on the other. So we have primaries and our secondaries. And inside here, we have our apolar cavity. This apolar cavity binds hydrophobic guests. Febreze is an anti-odor product and it's basically a cyclodextrin solution. So Febreze equals CD solution. It has nowadays a few fragrances in it. You can get differently fragranced Febrezes, but fundamentally it's cyclodextrin in a solution. How does it work? Well, the idea of Febreze is that you spray it where there's a smell, maybe your sofas, your curtains, your dog's been lying on a mat, it's your clothes that you don't want to bother washing because I know. Ugh. Anyway, you spray it with Febreze and the smell goes away. What it does is it binds small hydrophobic molecules. And most odours are small hydrophobic molecules. So you're binding them with the cyclodextrin. So you bind odours, and when you do that, you increase the apparent molecular weight of the odour because it's now in a complex. And if it's in a complex, it's less volatile. And if something's less volatile, it doesn't get to your nose as much. So it's less smelly. 
The odor hasn't gone away. It hasn't been destroyed. It hasn't magically disappeared. You have bound it in a complex and trapped it so it can't get to your nose. Then ultimately, the idea is that complex is water soluble. So it washes away. So the idea is you don't just keep squirting your cushions and your sofa cover and whatever else. Eventually, rather than just keep dumping Febreze into it, you take it off, you wash it, and you remove all the complex away, and then you go back. But you don't need to do it as often because you're temporarily trapping the odor molecules in there so it doesn't get smelly in the interim. It's a transformative product. It works in a different way. Prior to Febreze, the only things that you could do for odors was spray another odor on top of it. And then the other odor dominated the smell profile for a while until all the odor you'd sprayed had gone away and then the bad smell would come back. Okay, that was the traditional treatment for odors. Febreze turned that on its head by binding to the odor molecules. Interestingly, a good friend of mine who I did my PhD with worked on the development of Febreze by Procter & Gamble. Um, and it's an example of supramolecular chemistry done in industry. And one of the really fascinating things is that the company spent more money on marketing than they did on the campaign to actually do the technology inside the bottle. Because this was a hard ask to market. You've got consumers all over the country that are used to kind of spraying odours and not really working very well. And you have to persuade them that you have a new technology that binds the odours so you don't ever smell them again. And that takes a lot of marketing spend, explaining to consumers that it's worth their time and money, more importantly, to go out and buy this stuff. So Procter & Gamble sunk a huge amount of money into marketing the Febreze concept to the general public. Then, of course, once they'd done that and people knew what Febreze was, they put it in all their other products. So they could say, oh, this washing powder has Febreze technology inside it. And so they built cyclodextrins into washing powders to help complex and remove odours from clothes. And they could market that word, Febreze, to the consumer. So Febreze means something to the consumer. But for me, when I see Febreze, I just think cyclodextrin. They needn't market it to me because I know the chemistry that underpins the product.